Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, uh, Ms. Janhee, Ms. Pete, Ms. Peter, Mr. Arvind, and Mr. Ben. On behalf of uh, NNF Karnataka, uh, we, we give you a warm welcome. I hope my voice is clear, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, thank first of all, thank you for sparing time and uh, accepting our request to be part of this uh, program on this platform. So, thank you, Genworks, for all the support which you have been extending from uh, for uh, National Neurotal Forum for a very long time. Thank you. So, today we have got uh, really exciting topics uh, about uh, echo in an ICU and pediatrics. What are the technology trends? What are the latest updates? Uh, in the machine and in even in artificial intelligence, uh, what how it has evolved and where where we have reached at uh, the present scenario, and uh, how in innovation improves the outcomes in obstetric gynecology and fetal medicine. What are the latest developments and trends? And we have a topic on uh, phototherapy, uh, about uh, CFL versus LED versus Billy Banquet, cost versus uh, the comfort. And we have a spot Billy care screening uh, uh, check how it has changed or revolutionized uh, uh, um, the bilirubin management and how it has reduced significantly the um, hyperbilirubinemia leading to all the complications, neurological complications, how it has prevented and uh, how uh, it has made uh, uh, the life easy of a neonatologist and the practicing pediatrician when they're using it. So today we have really a wonderful speakers. Uh, first to start with uh, Jan He, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing it right. Uh, she has got uh, experience, a uh, lot of experience in this. She's been uh, in-house clinical application specialist supporting research and development. She's worked intensively with engineers in different phases of products development for various ultrasound system. Uh, work and contributed in making uh, of 3D probes and cardiac scanning probes. She has worked with key opinion leaders in uh, the development of next generation ultrasound products and features. And um, she has conducted a lot of training and clinical uh, a lot of training across the globe. And uh, from 1996 to 1999, she was uh, uh, doing an international application. As, she was working as an uh, international application specialist. And from 1990 to 1996, uh, she uh, was with National Heart Center Singapore as a senior cardiac technician in charge of cardiac ambulatory laboratory, trainer for cardiac technician and training program. So she comes with a lot of experience and a uh, lot of knowledge, and she has worked in detail with all the development of the products uh, uh, in, in the field of ultrasound. So, on behalf of uh, NNF Karnataka, a warm welcome to you, uh, Janhee. Followed by her talk, we have uh, uh, Mr. Peter. Uh, he has a very short, brief bio, if you have to give, from 1995 to uh, 2001. Uh, he was with Medical University of Innsbruck, Austria. From 2001 to 2013, he's worked as a clinical product manager at Women Cells Ultrasound at GE Healthcare. From 2013 till date, has been a commercial product manager for Wallison Expert and G at uh, GE Healthcare. So, Mr. Peter, thank you for accepting our request, and we also we give you extend warm welcome on behalf of NNF Karnataka. Arvind Sadayapan leads the critical care uh, area portfolio for the affordable care uh, segment GE Healthcare with specific focus on infant warmers, phototherapy, patient monitors, and ventilators. Arvind, on behalf of NNF Karnataka, a warm welcome to you as well. Then we have Ben Anoch from Menon Medical, is the Billy Care uh, product manager. He has been working in the NICU environment for more than 15 years. For many years, he has led critical product, a thermoregulation solution with unique offering to the NICU environment. Ben worked with key opinion leaders in USA, Europe, and Asia Pacific, and was instrumental in advancing the usage of such technology in that segment. 
Ben brings a powerful combination of NSU subject matter knowledge with deep technical expertise. He'll be presenting the Billicate products, the transcutaneous non-invasive uh, bilirubin meter. So today's session will be joined by our panelist, Dr. Vikas Satwik from Bangalore, Dr. Brindinaka Prithviraj from Bangalore, Dr. Ramakrishnan from uh, Salem, Dr. Nilesh Rao from Bangalore. So with, without wasting much of the time, now I request uh, Jan Ki to start the session. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I am Jan E. I'm going to share my uh, screen. Let's see. So, yeah. Yep. Do you see my screen? Yeah, we we can we can see your screen. Okay, good. Thank you very much again. Uh, my name is Jen E. I'm the global clinical trainer from uh, cardiovascular ultrasound, the GE Healthcare, and I'm presently uh, stationed in uh, Norway. And today, um, uh, thank you again for having me to talk a little bit on the echo in NICU and pediatrics uh, cardiac care. So this is a uh, a data a report uh, published in uh, early 2019 by Prof. Anita Sasna in Delhi. So in this, uh, in, uh, in this data there, we know approximately the birth uh, in India in 2018 was about 17 million. And considering a birth prevalence of congenital heart disease, um, in every 1,000 patients born, there's nine of them are born with congenital heart disease. And uh, to you sum it up, to, to sum it up, is about uh, it will be about 200,000 per year with patients uh, or babies born with congenital heart problem. Now, in these uh, 200,000, there are about 43,000 with severe congenital heart problems. And about a fifth of them needs intervention during the first year of their life. Now, uh, and uh, we know that um, there are a lot of challenges. In, in the study itself, it says that there are a lot of challenges uh, in India when it comes to uh, neonatal care. So the first and foremost is the affordability of the health care that uh, that the patients or the family has to pay all right and then you have the ability the availability of expertise there is uh, the doctors the nurses uh, who are uh, working around the clock in the uh, in the hospital or in the intensive care unit and of course uh, most importantly is also the equipment and the ex its technology that you as the caregiver uh, are uh, available that is available to you. Um, so talking about the challenges in cardiac care for infants now, I also would like to share with you some of the insights from uh, doctors around the world. We know that in neonatal space, uh, echocardiographers are needed to scan these infants who are usually um, less than, maybe born to less than 400 grams, and the windows are extremely small. And, and that the patients are, you know, are challenged, is a challenging, uh, is, is already in a challenging situation. And that you have also add, added technical problems, like, you know, you have to scan within the incubators. And the baby born, uh, they are inside the incubators and also, you know, surrounding in the cardiac care. There is a lot of uh, cardiac monitoring system. You have uh, the ventilators, you have uh, many things which are around in, in the same small unit. Uh, not just with the babies and, and the personnel. So on top of it, scanning on, on neonatals or pediatrics uh, patients, they are very daunting and very overwhelming because they are not like adult uh, echoes, you know, Ad adult echoes, we do um, very protocol driven uh, scanning. Where in this situation, neonatal patients, you know, they are first, they are, their life is, um, is is critically they are critically ill and that sonographers need to capture the, the the structures or the anatomy you know in a very short period of time so they go beyond just not you know just the normal protocol 
So all in all, we are talking about the challenges that you have. That is the time, the time which is not on the side of the patients. And you as the neonatologist and the pediatrics echocardiographers are working against, you know, against it. So the clock is ticking. So here you can see that it is a typical NICU scenario where newborns are being placed in, in incubators with the monitoring, as I said, with the ventilators surrounding them. And these newborns are, of course, under constant intensive care. During the stays here, usually that uh, uh, functional echo is needed during in the bedside to monitor, to evaluate their conditions. So in, as I said, in the neonatal intensive unit, targeted echo is very important. And in GE, what we did was that we have designed a system which is called the Vivid IQ with a size that is not just suits the NICU, it also provides clinicians with the state-of-the-art ultrasound on image quality and technology that will approve, that will uh, assist you in your patient care. So uh, Vivid IQ, it is a system which is very lightweight. It's about 5.2 kilos. And uh, when you're working on cut, it's up to four hours of battery life. Now, and uh, battery time of scan for scanning. Uh, the system itself is about has also a 15.6 inch ultra high resolution white screen, which also has a multi functions, which is a multi touch LCDs technology, which allows you to click or pinch or swipe like your uh, iPad or your tab uh, the tablets, uh, just like all the phones. So on top of it, uh, you also have this sealed user interface, which is which allows very fast um, and easy to clean, or it is mostly for this infection. So you could also, there's also a button on the system, which allows you to just lock the system and so that you can clean it without having to uh, dis disrupt the, the system. So the system itself is uh, very sleek and small, and the wheels it can turn 360, which makes it very, very convenient to move around in the NICU unit. Now, um, besides just those that I have to mention, it is, um, it is a system with uh, exceptional to the image quality and Doppler and color. So uh, it has a wide range, it provides a wide range of probes. Uh, from very small for neonatals to uh, fetus or toddlers. Uh, it has a wide range of imaging presets, including cardiac, vascular, lung, abdominal, and many more. Uh, it has a very intuitive uh, user interface, like I said uh, earlier, which you can actually pinch, you know, and slide like you are using your iPhone, uh, iPad. So there are many automated uh, workflow that is uh, incorporated on the system itself, like any of the Vivid systems. So you actually could use those uh, automated tools uh, coupled with the AI, the uh, artificial intelligence algorithm to speed up your work, to give you productivity and also uh, to increase uh, reproducibility. These are the wide range of uh, probes that is uh, that is um, used during uh, with for for neonates uh, for neonatal and uh, pediatrics. So you have the 12S RS probe, which is actually uh, for the uh, uh, neonatal, and you also have a, a little bit more, which is the 6S probe for a little bigger patient, and then you have the 8C and also the uh, L818, which is for linear, and this is for the Fontanel. It gives very, very good images. And also your 3SCRS and M5SC is much more for penetration, if it needs to be. So Vivid IQ features a wide range of uh, probes, and we constantly improve our system and the probe technology. So on the Vivid IQ, you actually see that it is an RS probe uh, connector. And this connector allows you, because it's miniaturized from what you know from the, uh, the previous uh, DLP system. So it also allows uh, the connector to be lighter and it helps to maximize ease of use, the probe and the cable itself. So again, 
Daily IQ is a system which is very portable and it's it's of a touch uh, uh, touch interface like what is shown here. So it's very easy to use. It's not anything which is very daunting uh, like any other some other systems. So now I'd like to touch a little bit on. Uh, sorry, let's see. OK, so we know that uh, neonatology imaging is uh, it needs a lot of speeds and we need to give confidence to our users while they are using. So we have very superb uh, uh, high resolution imaging and ded dedicated probes. Uh, on the system itself, OK, we have very good uh, image quality. Now, uh, again, I would like to say that time is everything when you are in the NICU. So and mentioned uh, again with sick babies and very stressed environment, you would like to do your work as as fast as possible. So on any vivid uh, systems, we uh, we allow our users to save the image uh, on both either DICOM raw data or on raw data format. And this allow you to provides you of uh, information or data that which you can use later. Now you can, of course, then allow, uh, have time to concentrate on just data collection and do your measurements afterwards. Um, having said that, so, you know, when you scan a patient in the lab, so in, in the unit, in the ICU, you are very stressed. Uh, so you collect your information and then you could actually go onto the system or the echo pad to do your studies. On the Vivid IQ um, and also on the echo pack, we have incorporated uh, pediatric heart networks Z-scores. So this Z-scores is actually an established Z-scores, which is from multi centers. And the, the, the Z-scores has a correlation, a very good correlation uh, um, compared to what was before, like a single center, a single center model like the Boston. So Z-scores allows, uh, allows the pediatricians uh, to, uh, it allows the pediatricians to use this so that to assist in uh, many of their clinical decisions making. Now there are just some of this uh, which I'd like to share. This are the few um, measurements that we have or with the pediatric net uh, heart network. Right on the second thing that we like to talk about today is also about the uh, automated uh, uh, automated Doppler spectrum, which is using um, artificial intelligence uh, in the background to help you in your workflow. So in G Healthcare, we aim to remove tedious tasks uh, and to make every moment count for you and your patient. So on this system, for example, I'm actually running on the Echo Pack. You could actually do your, 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 mesh, your, your, your data collection on the system and you analyze it on the Echo Pack. And going in to measure, you, the system allows you to do it, uh, to do either manual work or you can actually click onto the auto button and it will then trace the um, spectrum uh, for you. Obviously, there's much, much more that uh, besides this LVOT, there are many more that uh, you could do. So we provide a 98% of accuracy and about 100% of reproducibility. This is very important to you as a clinician when you are doing an, your uh, echo. So the next thing I would like to touch on is the uh, automated uh, function imaging uh, or the AFI, uh, which is uh, the industrial standard. OK, automated function imaging uses uh, two dimensional speckle tracking of the myocardium. It is a non invasive technique that has uh, applied to uh, cardio, uh, myocardial uh, mechanics in infants, children and uh, and also in adults. There are lots of publications which is being done and we know that um, AFI or two, uh, two dimension speckle tracking of the myocardium gives more than just ejection fraction. So let me just touch a little bit on this. Um, conventional measures of the left ventricular function as um, from as uh, for a long, long time, even when I was uh, a, an echo technician, 
we use uh, only MOD or bi biplane Simpson. In those days, we know that these are just a, a numbers that to show you the global uh, function. However, this has not, these are not able to help us into doing much more like we could, like uh, predicting um, failures of the myocardium before uh, before it actually manifests uh, in clinical situations. So our raw data images allows you to do a um, GLS of the patients to give you more uh, more information. Uh, adding to, on to ejection fraction and gives you uh, provides you changes in subtle changes before the myocardium before you can even detect it. Example, in a patient with uh, most of the LV segments, uh, which are normal, all right, uh, only with the postural lateral region, uh, which is uh, abnormal. If you use a biplane symptom or an M mode, you will never be able to see the difference. It will look like it has got the preserved ejection fraction. However, if you use the uh, speckle tracking, uh, you will be able to see the changes already happening. So why is speckle tracking echo so important? It provides the stolic function of the myocardia in preterm infants. It's um, it's very important because in the developing in, in the babies who are preterm, you're more monitoring the development over time. So it will be a added value to the clinicians when they are looking taking care of the kids. So adding GLS uh, also helps in predicting pre and post procedure in the in the closure of congenital heart disease, for example, uh, with patients who are on PDA. So um, on top of it, OK, you can also use to um, global uh, longitudinal strain in uh, heart failure patients in, in heart failure patients who are like, you know, uh, for transplant to enhance the prognosis uh, after transplant. And also it's very important to do this uh, uh, for cardiac oncology children because uh, adding the longitudinal uh, strain to ejection fraction in the follow up of the uh, cancer patient can help to uh, monitor the pre heart failures uh, conditions, the incidence and also allows uh, oncologists and pediatrics cardiologists to work together to ensure the well-being of the little patients. So on the uh, ultra addition, the uh, uh, Vivid IQ, we also have uh, LV, um, AFI of the LV. Again, AFI uh, is a non-invasive method to assist the characterization of monitoring and monitoring of cardiac functions in preterm babies. So the benefits is a lot. It's a tool that can be used for pre and post uh, operative monitoring, for example, in Fontan procedures. It is a non-invasive uh, measures of ventricular functions in evaluation of the changes in the ventricle. So it can also be applied to assess myocardial uh, mechanics in infants and children with uh, cardiac or non-cardiac uh, disorders. And also uh, in, many, in many clinical studies, okay, the, in preterm clinical studies, we can also see that uh, surgical ligation in, a patient, uh, in patient with the patent ductus arteriosus uh, has also a sudden elevation in their LV uh, afterload. And these are things that we are, which also, you know, we using GLS, it will also help to monitor the LV function of the patients during the follow up. Now, we also have on the system the AFIRV. Now, AFIRV is also a very um, powerful uh, predictor for many of the procedures uh, for, for, for the pediatrics patients. So in uh, AFI RV, you also provide, we also provide the global longitudinal strain, the free wall strain, and also the TAPC, which is important when you look at the function of the heart. So it's a non-invasive uh, surrogate of uh, RV contractility, especially good in, um, uh, in predicting a, a patient, you know, for post-operative uh, period of the TOF. And also at the same time, 
it um, it helps in uh, in the in the monitoring of patient with uh, left heart uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. All right. So the systemic right ventricular function influence the morbidity and mortality of uh, also after the Fontan um, operation. So AFI LA is a, a novel uh, method to assess the left atrial function, allowing global strain to be measured on using speckle tracking echocardiography. So the benefits is a lot. So here I have stated that it's a, a very good prognostic pro 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 prognostic uh, um, indicator for, um, for for pediatric heart transplant patients. So it uh, correlates very much because the LA strain correlates very much with the uh, pulmonary uh, capillary uh, wedge pressure uh, invasively and can identify at the same time uh, elevated pressures better than the traditional um, traditional the uh, diastolic function parameters. So, and it supports a lot of uh, parameters which we will be very interested to look into uh, very much for mostly for patients with um, the heart transplant and, and graft uh, dysfunctions. So I have come to the uh, end of my uh, of my presentation. Um, and this slide, I would just have a uh, would like to uh, remind uh, and give an overview um, that the BBIQ Ultra Edition is a system designed for the user by our user in by our user, as I mean that uh, many of our users have been involved in um, the in in the designing of the system so it has a very intuitive as uh, a uh, user interface and it's ai driven uh, me measurements package and that we have we are probably the only system in the whole industry that provides uh, z scores from pediatric heart networks and this is a very good quantitative tool. And we also have more quantitative tools like the AFI, LV, RV, and LA, which is very, which are very powerful diagnostic and prognostic uh, for the care and treatment of our little patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Janhi. Uh, we will take up uh, the question related to this after uh, Peter's talk. So now I request Mr. Peter to start the session. Wonderful session. A lot of questions are there. Janhi, we will discuss after his talk. Over to you, Mr. Peter. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm uh, Peter Falkensammer. I'm the product manager for the Women's Health Ultrasound team uh, of GE Healthcare. I'm based in Austria. Uh, and it's a pleasure to discuss with you innovations uh, and, and how latest trends are in the field of ultrasound in obstetrics, uh, gynecology and fetal medicine. Now, uh, when we talk about ultrasound in uh, women's health, there is a very, pre very broad variety. Uh, and, you know, as um, the focus of, you know, women as they're aging, they're, change, they're changing, you know, starting from early gynecological questions through obstetrics, potentially through assisted reproduction, but also a lot of uh, postmenopausal questions, you know, with, you know, uh, the, the, the challenges of aging women in gy urogynecology and oncology are questions that we're typically faced with. So all this uh, shows you a really wide variety of clinical questions that we're, um, that we're dealing with on a daily basis. And this is why uh, within the Women's Health Ultrasound, we have a pretty broad focus on innovation. And over decades, the Women's Health uh, Ultrasound team has brought up several innovations and has been the first uh, on many of technologies that have uh, hit the market and are still very successfully used today. You know, starting uh, back with more than 40 years ago with real-time probes, with transvaginal ultrasound, with 3D ultrasound, portable ultrasound, 
uh, or portable 3D ultrasound. And, and definitely now in the later times, um, technologies and innovation around 3D. Um, and all of those are just here to, um, you know, to offer technology for you as clinicians uh, in their everyday practice. Now, um, also recently, uh, we have uh, we are continuing this uh, route of innovation, um, and I think you some you may be aware that we're typically trying to introduce new technology about once a year with uh, significant updates to the Volusion systems. Now, over the years, this has progressed quite a bit, and uh, I recently got those images from uh, Professor Shawi, which some of you may know. Uh, who is a fetal medicine expert in, in Berlin, Germany, um, as he was preparing a, a, a talk for the 30-year anniversary of ISUOC. And he showed um, the development of ultrasound imaging over 30 years. And it's pretty impressive to see how far that has come along with in this particular case, which are all cases of a hypoplastic left heart. Um, on, um, on on how those technologies have changed over the years. But it's not only in uh, 2D or color imaging. Also, when we look at the innovation in 3D imaging, where, uh, you know, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, um, it took several hours to calculate a 3D, images, a 3D image. And now we're doing uh, this with, with uh, high-speed computers, in, in, in a few milliseconds with uh, substantial higher resolution, better differentiation, so that we can you know, have a more real life uh, experience and, and a bit more realistic experience. So that also patients who are not experts uh, in interpreting ultrasound images, but uh, also patients uh, can much better appreciate anatomy, but also pathology. Um, in on, on an ultrasound screen. Now, over the years, that technology has expanded quite a bit, and um, our estimate as of last year was that we're hitting almost 350 million examinations globally with Volusion equipment. So I think this is uh, also a representation of the, of the innovation and the reach that uh, this technology has been able to achieve over the years. Now, when we talk about the innovation, um, I want to uh, emphasize the Volusion E10 ultrasound system, uh, because this is typically the platform where we're bringing most of our innovation, where typically new technology uh, is introduced on, on the market first. And there are several aspects of innovation. One is imaging performance. And when we talk about imaging performance, we're building this on a strong architecture. So the architecture in the console is uh, contains hardware and software and um, gets updated with a certain regularity. So to keep it at the latest level of technology. And this combined, for example, with, with new innovative probe technologies as they come along, really give you the basis for a good image quality. You know, whether it's for 2D imaging, whether it's for 3D or 4D imaging. And what you see here is the RM7C probe, which has just been introduced um, on the latest platform or the latest version of the Volusion E10 ultrasound system, which is built on uh, XD Clear, so the latest um, transducer technology to give you extra sensitivity uh, when you want to see detail which will give you extra bandwidth in patients that are, you know, that are hard to scan when you need extra penetration. But it's not only probe technology that we're constantly focusing on, you know, with the increased power of, of, of computers, with the increased power of graphic cards, that allows to integrate several algorithms to uniquely visualize blood flow, for example. As we can see here with the introduction of radiant flow that, that has been done a few years ago, which gives you a very uh, realistic dimension of blood flow. Or the later introductions of slow flow, which is a, 
very low velocity blood flow uh, visualization technique um, that has a high sensitivity and really can show you the fine details of the vascularization in the placenta, in the brain. Uh, and now with the latest enhancements, as you see here at the bottom right, you can also do this in 3D, which is a very unique and sensitive way of visualizing blood flow. But not only for that, uh, we're also enhancing the grayscale imaging. Um, and one of the latest enhancements that I want to introduce is a shadow reduction technique. So often, you know, when there's bones, when there's, you know, interfaces between organs, we're faced with shadowing behind a structure. And you see uh, two very typical examples here, you know, with the uh, lower uterine segment um, with uh, shadowing behind bones. So this is a dedicated technique which detects those areas where shadowing occurs and fills those area with addition, additionally acquired low frequency signals. So by this, you can re really appreciate also information from areas that are typically obscured by a high frequency, uh, by high frequency, high frequency setting. Now with that, uh, I'd like to take you through what does, you know, what this means clinically or what does innovation mean clinically and where uh, are the, uh, where are those high, those latest technologies particularly used, used for? And one focus that we have is first trimester ultrasound because the earlier um, a physician can detect an anomaly, the more time uh, the parents have to get adjusted to the situation and consider different options, how they want to uh, deal with the situation. And this is why uh, early detection in first trimester is a key of our uh, clinical strategy because the earlier uh, we can detect it or the better tools we can provide, the earlier you, know, you as a clinician can, can detect anomalies. And this is again a combination of probe technologies with high frequency transvaginal probes with 3D technologies such as HD Live uh, which helps to visualize three-dimensional uh, embryos, for example, and really show normal anatomy, but also show pathology to patients. Or regular, let's say, you know, visualization of blood flow. Again, as we showed you before, uh, for second trimester, this is also typically very helpful if we want to look at the heart in the first trimester, if we want to look at the fetal circulation in the first trimester, where there's lots of opportunity to detect anomalies uh, already at 14, 15, 16 weeks of gestation. So first trimester is really a very broad field. The other aspect that we're very highly focusing on is the fetal heart. Um, and why is the fetal heart so important for us? You know, the fetal heart is complex. It's a very, you know, complex, difficult structured organ, uh, and which is often, as we also saw in the previous talk, uh, uh, faced with congenital anomalies, broadly in the range of about 1% of pregnancies, you know, sometimes more severe, sometimes less severe. But also, look, but looking at this from a global point of view, uh, the detection rates are have a very high variety. So sometimes significantly below 50%, sometimes higher than 50%. But you know, even in 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 highly developed and industrialized countries, we're far away from having uh, a 80, 90, or even higher uh, percentage of detection rate. So this is why. It is one of our strategies at Women's Health Ultrasound to improve those areas of assessment of the fetal heart. Now, um, when we look at who's doing fetal heart evaluations, then we're, then we're interacting with multiple different specialities. So we have, first, we have obstetricians who typically do screening and, and the early detection and who typically try to, to identify, you know, normal from abnormal, um, and which is a you know which is a key 
uh, in this whole uh, chain of you know potential referrals because that is uh, the first question that needs to be asked and, and needs to be answered if a heart is normal or not. Once it's suspect, suspected abnormal, a specialist on the fetal heart um, can look into this in more detail and get to a diagnosis. And ultimately, often we get fetal or pediatric cardiologists involved who monitor the situation uh, until delivery. So it's really multiple different specialities with different skill sets and different expectations on technology. And this is also why there is a lot of different tools available when we want to analyze the fetal heart, you know, with, you know, typically, of, of course, looking at blood flow. So color Doppler plays a very important role. Pulsed wave Doppler, M mode and uh, 3D technologies or newer technologies such as speckle tracking on the fetal heart. Uh, all those are techniques that uh, that are used to evaluate the fetal heart. And it's obviously now, quite a bit of a challenge because whoever uses those tools needs to have quite some skill set and know how to handle the ultrasound equipment, handle the functionality, but also how to interpret this data. Now, when we look at, when we generally look at uh, these fetal cardiac tools uh, and also tools to, uh, that are available to evaluate, for example, fetal cardiac function, and typically we can categorize them in two main categories. One is the qualitative and one is the quantitative approach. And qualitative really means we're, we're visualizing and demonstrating the anatomy in B mode, in color Doppler, or also in tissue Doppler. Whereas quantitative approach means we're measuring something, you know, using either t spectral Doppler, tie indexes, you know, M mode measurements, ejection fractions, uh, and on, and so on and so forth. So there's and 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 obviously you know all of those measurements have a clinical context, and this is why uh, the the there are relative pretty high expectations in terms of skill set to whoever is operating those uh, functionalities. Now with that, I'd like to spend some time on a dedicated tool which is called Fetal HQ which is a comprehensive fetal cardiac assessment package. Um, at within Women's Health Ultrasound, we have introduced this fetal HQ tool uh, about two years ago, and uh, which gives a very comprehensive analysis of the heart. And why is that the case? Because when there's uh, changes in the fetal circulation, when there's lack of oxygen, when there's uh, growth restrictions, um, there we typically or often also see a remodeling of the fetal heart to compensate for the lack of oxygen. And when, when we see a changing in the fetal heart, we, they are typically represented in three different uh, aspects. The heart may change its size. For example, it may get bigger um, or more hypertrophic to, to have a, uh, you know to, to, to deal with a different volume of blood. It may change its shape, so it may become more round or more globular as it may have to as, as it may have to pump more and uh, it may change the contractility. So all these are the three main aspects that uh, that fetal HQ can provide to you. So this is a tool that is has been specifically designed for the use of uh, cardiac evaluation in the fetus. Um, and with that, there come a few unique requirements. First, as you can see here on the on the right side of the screen, you know, in, in fetal life, it is important to evaluate both ventricles simultaneously. So you can do the right and the left ventricle simultaneously. Um, and based on that, it is using speckle tracking technology. On the there's there's a couple of different ways to analyze it. First, um, you also, as I discussed before, you can have the qualitative approach. So that means you can visualize contractility of the ventricles. Um, and as you can see here, we're demonstrating in systolic and end diastolic boundaries uh, for the right and for the left ventricle. And you can see this uh, also movement. Uh, you, you can see the movement of the beating heart, heart on this as well. 
But on top of that, you can also analyze it in a quantitative way. So that means it can measure. And when we're measuring, we're uh, typically uh, following a, a 24 segment approach. So we're, we're dividing the heart from base to apex into 24 segments, as you can see here on the right side of the screen. So eight basal segments, eight mid segments, and eight segments in the apex. Um, and you know this is done for the right and left ventricle. And also, what is then part of this fetal HQ package is that the those dimensions can are analyzed in multiple different in a few different ways. First, we're looking at the end diastolic diameters, and you can see the chart here on the top of the screen. Um, you're seeing here on the right side for the left ventricle in green. For in the right ventricle in blue, you're seeing the dimensions and you're seeing a normal gram in the background. So by just by looking at uh, those results, you can determine is the heart of a normal size. Um, and as you can see here, and uh, my the speaker before also mentioned on, on C-scores. So these are C-scores. Um, but, you know, developed for fetal uh, measurements here so that it is important that you can also uh, validate that the dimensions that you measure are appropriate for a fetus that size, which is, which is, uh, which is a key question. The next uh, item below is to analyze the shape. And for shape, we look at the sphericity index. And the sphericity index, we're dividing the, the for each of those 24 segments, we're div dividing the diameter diameter of the ventricle by the length, and so you can see um, whether uh, the heart is actually changing its shape and whether the shape is getting outside a normal range. And then for each of those 24 diameters, we're showing a fr uh, fractional shortening as a contractility measurement. So we're calculating the fractional shortening between end systolic and end diastolic measurement. Um, and out of those, that, that uh, ratio of contraction uh, or the percentage of fractional shortening is calculated, which gives you a number of how well those uh, this ventricle contracts. Now, um, there has been a lot of uh, research ongoing over the last few years on this and as you can see here um, the most of those papers were published in the last two to three years um, to put uh, fetal hq measurements into clinical context and there is a few examples um, that i just want to pick out and and uh, and highlight to you the first one and all of them all of those have been published uh, earlier this year some actually are still uh, most of them are actually still not uh, published in paper, but still published uh, electronically ahead of press. So this one is a uh, was a study around, um, and and this group looked into whether fetal HQ could help improve the sensitivity and uh, reduce the false positive rate of a prenatal detection of. Uh, coarctation of the aorta um, and uh, by using the fetal HQ concept. And the conclusion that they get, got to was, and, and I'm aware that this is at the moment a very you know, shortened and superficial way of uh, discussing this, but uh, what I want to do with this is that I really emphasize to you and uh, those papers are available online. Um, by those societies, but so that you can actually, if you're interested in this, that you can take the opportunity to look into this in more detail. But the conclusion of this one was that fetal HQ may assist examiners in identifying fetuses with coarctation of the aorta that might otherwise not have been identified. And also it may help separating fetuses who will have coarctation of the aorta postnatally from those who have a false positive diagnosis. So looking at the heart, looking at uh, size, shape, and contractility of the heart and the ventricles in more detail may actually be an aspect of 
uh, differentiating uh, or, or identifying coarctation of the aorta or also reduce false positive diagnosis here. The other aspect uh, where fetal HQ has been used recently, and uh, that that publication is uh, not even two months ago, is to look at cardiac function in uh, twin to twin transfusion surgeries. Um, and they looked at uh, the recipient twin um, before and after laser therapy. And on those all of those fifteen uh, pregnancies that they evaluated, they could see a decrease in the dimensions, an improvement uh, of, the, for, of the right ventricle, an increase of the left ventricular base dimension, but also more important, um, an improvement in all functionality parameters, an improvement in strain, an improvement in fractional area change, an imp uh, improvement in basal apical length, fractional change, and uh, in several of those 24 segments, the contractility has been improved. So again, uh, fetal HQ is a tool here that may significantly help clinicians to understand uh, fetal cardiac function here. And the third one that I would like to emphasize is the um, cardiac measurements in, of, of size and shape in IUGR fetuses with an absent or reverse diastolic velocity. And the conclusion that this, uh, that this group took was that, you know, for fetuses with a smaller size in the area of the right and left ventricular, left ventricle, or those with a globular shaped right ventricle had a lower risk for prenatal death. Now, that is, you know, that is, uh, as of right now, we're not yet sure on how much that can be translated into clinical routine. But as you can see, um, fetal HQ can contribute to understanding fetal cardiac dimension, fetal cardiac shape, fetal cardiac functionality in different clinical situations. Um, and with that, better understand what, uh, what the fetus uh, and how to put those how to put those findings into a clinical context. Now there is one uh, one more topic that I would like to touch on. Uh, and now this is less clinically, um, but it's more a technology tool or a workflow enhancement. Because um, ultrasound systems are, you know, complex system workflow is sometimes difficult. And one of the latest enhancements, and now we're moving a little bit away from clinical context here, is that we're introducing Sonolist. Um, Sonolist is a uh, tool based on artificial intelligence that can automatically analyze acquired images. And out of this analysis, it can automatically identify fetal anomaly. Because we think that with this uh, clinicians can improve their efficiency when scanning, they imp can improve their consistency when scanning, have a better quality control, and also you potentially use this in teaching uh, scenarios. Now, what exactly would that be? Let me give you a couple of examples here. So, as, you know, assume you're scanning, um, and as soon as you hit freeze, uh, the system will analyze what you have on the screen. So, I'll show you. So you're scanning, you're hitting freeze, and this algorithm will identify that this was a spine. And on the next image, it will identify that this was a profile. Um, the next one, it will identify that this is a hand. And the fourth example that we have here, it will, it will as soon as you hit freeze, it will identify that this was a foot. Now, um, the question now is, you know, how is this helpful or how can this be used? And, and what, what would the system recognize? So at the moment, we're focusing on second trimester examinations here. And out of, uh, and we're, we're following guidelines that the International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology 
has put out on what should be part of a second trimester examination. And out of those suggested views, uh, Sonolist, so this program, can detect 20 views that are on those lists here and will be able to determine if you have or which of those 20 views you have on the screen. Now, additionally, it can do, uh, it can actually show you the criteria and, and show you acceptance criteria on what should be on the screen. So, for example, um, if we're looking at an, uh, you know, if we're looking, for example, at the four chamber view, you, you should see the spine, you should see a full length of the ribs. What are those uh, criteria that are defined by the ESUOC guidelines on what should be, what a standardized view looks like? Now, what is the, what is the advantage of this? You can use this in a training or teaching environment. You know, when you have new ultrasonographers uh, who are learning how to scan, then this tool can help them to generate image, images according to standardized guidelines. And the system will exactly tell them which of those criteria have been met and which one are still missing. Um, so that is one benefit. The other benefit is that is the aspect of efficiency, because what, you know clinicians are always busy in a hurry and um, and have a high demand for efficiency. And it is important for somebody who's performing a second trimester examination, which is quite comprehensive, to be sure that by the end of the examination they have seen everything. So with this. The combination of, you know, because Sonolist uh, may identify what you have on the screen. And with this, it will also uh, generate a scan assistant protocol that you can define yourself. And uh, with the goal that by the end of the examination, you can make sure that you have seen everything. And all this may come with uh, without an extra push of a button. Um, so that by the end of the examination, you can get a list, as you can see here on the screen, that uh, which shows you what are the views that you have been uh, that you have identified, that you have checked off, that you have documented. So with that, um, I would like to conclude on this and uh, really thank you for your attention here today. Um, Volusion ultrasound really, you know, continues to keep evolving, whether it is with performance in ultrasound, per imaging performance, technology performance, with focus that we have on, clean, on fetal heart, on gynecology, on first trimester, or also the integration of artificial te technology. Um, as this may evolve further, uh, and help clinicians in their everyday practice. So thanks so much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Um, so now we will open up the discussion. So I would like to invite our panelists for today, uh, Dr. Vikas Satwik and Dr. Nilesh Rao, Dr. Dinakar. Uh, first, we'll start with Dr. Vikas. So your views on today's session and a uh, few questions would have come to you as well. Over to you, Dr. Vikas. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I, th I think the technology has, you know, gone leaps and bounds in, you know, in the the last uh, decade, especially. Uh, I had um, a question for Jan. Is um, I think your your machine is fantastic. Um, the way we would thank you. I mean, you can basically give me everything. I need to know know in in in, in the in, in the in, in the baby's heart. Just one thing that was cropping up my mind all the time that you were doing the presentation was, is there a probe or does your machine do 3D? Or is there yes. anything that well, can, we well, can do? So there is a probe that is uh, on, the, on the Vivid IQ. At the moment, you have a 3D probe, which is transesophageal, which is uh, more uh, catered more for the adults or for... For pediatrics, which is um, more than uh, 25 kilograms, so um, <clears throat> and there are of course uh, pediatrics probes, which is 
also available, which is also on Vivid, on the Vivid series, but it will be on the high-end Vivid series. Uh, recently in uh, August uh, or September, during the European meeting, we actually launched a uh, pediatric uh, 6VC on the E95. And that is the uh, probe which is running for pediatrics at the moment. So, and it's, um, you're able to scan all the way down to uh, babies about 500 gram. Uh, but it is not available uh, presently on the Vivid IQ, but again, on um, uh, in GE Healthcare, at least, uh, you know, so for, for the many years that I have been around in, the, in the GE, we always uh, have a transfer of technology. So uh, the transfer of technology means to say that eventually, you know, all this um, will be available on other systems. I mean, on the uh, lower end system, but I cannot give you when it's uh, this is going to happen. But again, it is to tell you that our, our technology is such that we do not just, you know, just keep it on the lower end of the system. Yeah. Thank you. Uh... One, one question I had was when you mentioned about uh, such cores and auto mode function. So the, the, the thing was that does that actually automatically give me a, a, a printout at the end of my session that I do from A to Z about the scanning of the heart, everything that I need to know, should I enter anything different or should I cross reference? Uh, previously, I've had experiences with parameter Z, so you enter everything there. And so the, the question and then the, the question comes is of the printouts. Because then yes. I have to explain to the parents. I have to tell, and I have to uh, substantiate. I have to tell my surgeons, this is what we are, you know, is happening in the in in in, in the newborn heart. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is where we had issues. Like, um, you know, uh, one is uh, the numbers. The other mm -hmm. one is um, regarding interoperator variability. Yeah, I'll Will it compensate for yes. that, or uh, how do, how do we go about that? Uh, are you talking about uh, normal studies, the printing yes, out? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, you could actually connect a system, your Vivid IQ, to a printer, and you could actually print out uh, in the report, in the form of a report. And you could actually also, at the same time, choose the different uh, images to print alongside with the, the measurements. So that itself, uh, Vivid IQ allows you to do that. Yeah. And then you are talking about the intra operator availability for the the measurements. Okay, now if you are using the uh, AI auto measurements, all right, uh, we found out that you know if you use the AI, it has got um, the 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 reproducibility is really high. You know, as I've as a, as it has been quoted, okay, it's about hundred percent. Okay, the intra uh, variability is. Um, not uh, not any worse than what uh, what we have seen, you know, the, on the inter. So it's actually quite a very good uh, reproducibility on that side. Thank you. Just one last question. Uh, I, I think uh, the the spectral tracking has come a long way, and uh, yes. uh, I think it's fantastic that all chambers, except I think the the left atrium was left out. Um, uh, the right atrium is now still the one, the only one which is uh, which is not uh, there yet. Yes. So, uh, which 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 brings me to the point, like you know, because I I uh, we do have a lot of uh, uh, people logged in who are maybe new to speckle tracking and you know may not uh, be fully aware of it. Uh, yes. Because I feel that very few centers across do speckle tracking and you know the use of those. Would you be able to explain it? A bit about that so that you know everybody's clear about what exactly it means and you know just just a few basics please okay it's just a few the basics the point is that when you are actually scanning uh, a uh, well when you're doing a four chamber for example right what the of the heart okay maybe i should uh, um get my image uh, another presentation while you ask peter the questions well let me uh, get my presentation uh, i can do some small uh, explanation afterwards thank you that'll be that'll be awesome nilesh uh, do you have any questions oh excellent uh, very stimulating uh, presentations thanks for the thanks peter and uh, jan I think it's a very new, see, from uh, 
I think, Doctor, because you are trained in cardiology, for from for me, it's more of a functional, you know, uh, a neonatologist performed echo kind of perspective. So I think speckle and I think uh, most of the speckle tracking and you know the myocardial deformation analysis was more in the research realm till recently. I now um, I think we are having more and more um, data on this. And I was reading through it and I, most of the studies are from G. Like if you the using G machines, so there are um, uh, parameters like standard parameters for term babies. So I had a question for. Um, uh, Ms. Yan, about the spectral tracking. I think um, spectral tracking, it detects kind of acoustic, um, you know, signals on the myocardium. How good is it for like very small, you know, extreme preemies, like, you know, 24 weekers. And I think in other countries, 22, 23 weekers, they are kind of, um, we have started resuscitating. So are there any studies validated in those babies? Because I think uh, these days functional echo is being done in the first week, many days, and I'm sure uh, this modality, which assesses both global and LV and you know, regional strain will be used more and more. So any studies on that or? Okay, um, it, very basically, okay. I have a, a very, 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 very basic, uh, so simple. Uh, it's a, it's actually a presentation. If you want to bear with me, <laughs> I could go and do this. Uh, I could do this presentation to, just to give you an idea um, how um, speckle tracking comes up, comes along. Okay, so uh, and I gave this actually to. Um, my um, colleagues in uh, India uh, not so long ago during COVID, when COVID started. So, okay, I'm going to share uh, my screen. It takes a bit, okay, of a time, so bear with me, all right? Okay, let's do a little bit of a brief history of time, okay? Hello. Can you see my, uh, my desktop? Yes, okay. we can see you. So, uh, I hope you can you see the desktop too? Um, yeah, we can see your presentation. Okay, good. All right. So uh, it's a long, long time ago. Let's go back all the way to uh, when uh, when when echo started. How echo started? Okay. So we know that LV function, the past, present, and the future. In the past, okay, while I was still an echo uh, technician, we are so you know we are so privileged to have a uh, mode. And we're so privileged to look at diastology in terms of spectrum, okay? And we are also um, happy to have a, a, a LV function looking looking LV function using biplane symptom, okay? Those were the days, okay? Because we don't have the uh, ability to see other things, and we always wonder how come patient fails, and and this ejection fraction doesn't help at all, right? So, as you can see, this is the evolution of echo. So in 1953, you know, you have Adler and people, and they, they came up with the first uh, M mode, right? So you can see the M mode itself, you know, and those are not very quantitative at that moment, but, you know, we try our best. So you have the two gurus there, you know, looking at uh, the picture, which is, I think this is also in 1953. So then you could see something. So then you have uh, the, the, the first part of, you know, learning how to do spectrum. That is uh, Dr. Leif Hadley, which is in the middle, okay? And then you have the group of people who are working in Trondheim, you know, the first people who are using a Doppler. And they are the ones who actually comes with this uh, fantastic tool of uh, Doppler, Spectrum Doppler, which we use even till today. So as I said again, while I was still a tech, okay, we are looking at 2D images, all right? They don't really give you very much uh, information, all right? So if you have a patient which is actually normal, uh, at your uh, well, the, the 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 basal one third of your of your of your of your ventricle, you will not be able to tell the distal one third of the of the ventricle, the function of the ventricle. So you are actually using a mode which is not rep representative of the whole ventricle, uh, and it's very wrong because then we report. Like I used to remember that we report this you no know, fifty percent, and then of course we have to you know put in you know. Uh, LV function is 45 and um, a regional wall motion has been seen on this and this and this, but it's not quantitative. It's not good enough. All right. 
So then the, we have to go on, you know, using eyeballing. There are, all, there are the times where we actually eyeball and say, oh, you know, ejection fraction doesn't look this great. It's about, you know, 40 or 30 or 25. Well, those were the days. Very non-quantification uh, kind of studies. So then again, then you have this, you know, in 89, you know, you have this first uh, Carl Isaac, you know, he came out the first myocardial wall, the traces. So then you can actually see the different phases, you know, in the diastole to the systole, the D, the, the D point, the E point, and, you know, what have you, the E and A. So you can actually basically look at them and tell that, you know, this is a, you know, the diastolic dysfunction, even though uh, in the Doppler itself, okay, you can have a normal uh, mitral EA ratio. But then again, on the myocardium, it already is there and is shown to you that, you know, patient is actually going into dysfunction. So then you have going down, you know, you have uh, in 92 and then you have 93 and then 95. George Sutherland came with tissue Doppler imaging where it's very, very sensitive. We think at that time, we think that is, you know, is the state of the art, you know, it's uh, the best thing that ever happened. Uh, so and that itself is actually good. But it is angle, uh, you know, it's angle dependent. So you, by a little bit of, a, you know, a, a shift, your angle is, your, 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 your values will be, you will have er uh, errors in your values. And having said that, okay, uh, and also, it's also uh, how you see. So technically speaking, you have to have a real four chamber, right? But if you have something which is a foreshortened, so you will have, uh, you will also get a wrong an error in the the t the 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 diastolic uh, flow too. So that itself is also wrong. So we are doing echo. People who are doing echo, we have to be very careful. Technically speaking, we must make sure that everything has to be done correctly to get to give uh, uh, informations for the clinicians that make sense. So that is our tissue velocity imaging. OK, so then you go on. Sorry, I'm going to skip some of these things. So <clears throat> so this is the tissue tracking. You probably have seen that, uh, you know, um, in the past. OK, so then we have different mod mod modalities which, which we come out, you know, the strain and then the strain rate to actually uh, uh, help the clinicians to do more studies. But then at that time, around about 95, 6, 7, 8, and to 2000. You know, a lot of things are very, you know, it's researchy because nobody knows what exactly it is. Okay, so we know that the group of people who actually contributed to this is actually Dr. Leif Hatley and George Sutherland and Lars Orker from Sweden. So they did a good job. So we know that also when you are doing uh, when you're doing dissection, right, you go in, you see how the system, how the heart actually looks like. So the heart consists of three most important fibers. You know, you have the longitudinal, okay? That's where the displacement of your mitral uh, annulus. And then we also realize that the heart doesn't pound, that the heart doesn't, you know, um, beat um, going from the, 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 the apex to the mitral valve. It's actually the mitral valve going upwards. So then you can actually, uh, using the, the basal, uh, basal of the uh, mitral annulus to track the to give your to give more inf, uh, inf, information uh, you know, when it comes to strain. So we have we know that there's a longitudinal strain and we know there's a circumferential strain and we also know another one which is called a torsion, right? Yeah. All we need to know about these are uh, these are just the resolution of some skip. Okay, so here there's another thing we need to know is the angle. Okay, so by by a shift of 15, 15 degrees, there will be a 10% in error which means to say that, yeah, you know, it's good. TBI is good, but TBI needs more. We need to get the information out. We need to have the strain rate to come up. So which means to say that we need to come up with some more things. So that is where, where more things, you know, more things are being developed. You know, the strain comes in. So then, okay, I'm going to just keep, all right. <clears throat> so this is the new methods, okay of uh, quantifying the global function okay we know it's speckle tracking okay so here I, I you know don't try to be very stressed okay don't don't be stressed when you see this because it's actually very simple very easy to understand because 
uh, strain is not so difficult. You not need to. You now need to know only to actually have established numbers so that this will gives you all these curves will gives you information uh, to the problems that you have that or your patient has to give you more information so that you can treat better treat uh, better treat the patient. Right. So there you go. This is the uh, this is the, the the way that the system works. The longitudinal is just like the coffee uh, cup, the, the coffee strainer. So then you have the uh, uh, circumferential, and then then you have the torsion. Okay. So here is just part of what we see. You know, in when you do. So deformations allows uh, analysis of myocardia. So here, this picture here. Okay. So it's very simple. We, when you talk about 2D speckle tracking, you are tracking a specific point, and that means to say your cursor. For example, you place the cursor on that point, and during the whole cycle, okay, this system, the algorithms will follow, it will be able to follow you or follow the, the, the contraction, which will give you a information of the strain. So in diastole, is uh, is the state where we are, uh, where the heart is actually at rest. So in systole, it goes in, right? So that it means to say that if you have probably, I, I have very little, I, have, I, can, I can only remember very little of my physics from, from high school, okay? But I know that when it goes in and something has to change, it's always a minus. So then you relate this to a deformation. So the deformation comes in terms of minus how much. So there is a, sta a standard which is being set but there are many uh, 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 people, many centers are working on getting a, a standard of values. Of course, when you are using different systems, they all have different uh, numbers. That's why uh, it's very important to come up with a multi-center uh, studies to establish a number. Uh, as far as I know today, there is no established numbers for the children as yet. They are working on it. Uh, so. What you need to know is just to you know refer to some of the uh, more uh, the people who are actually working on strain like we you know the group where is actually in uh, Toronto with Luke Martins where he is actually also one of the one of the uh, Dr. Leaf Hadley's student when the Leaf was actually in Leuven uh, as a professor there. So uh, strain is obviously related to L, uh, LB ejection fraction. Okay, so the less ejection fraction you have which means to say that there'll be less strain in the, in the myocardium. But of course, when you're looking at it, you know, uh, ejection fraction is about talking about how the heart squeezes the blood out. Okay, it's about the volume. Tracking, spe uh, speckle tracking, uh, the strain itself is talking about how hard your myocardium works. Okay. So that itself is uh, it's how we are looking at uh, what we are looking at when we are looking at uh, spectral tracking in um, uh, in AFI. And coming up to uh, the the other question that I was asked just now, that uh, I mean all the studies right now you know uh, established is mostly on uh, adults uh, adults echo. We know that uh, pediatrics has its challenges also at the same time. The challenges comes in where children has very, you know, like for example, atria. Atria has very thin walls, okay? So which means to say the tracking part, you have to be very, very uh, meticulous about it. Uh, it cannot be too thick or else you're actually not tracking properly. Now talking about tracking on the ventricle side, you also need to uh, make sure that you uh, have the correct width Okay, the region of interest that it covers the myocardium and not, you know, not more, and that will gives you um, um, useful informations of the myocardium uh, deformation. Okay, I won't go on with the with the with the slides because the slides is just too much. I think I will bore Peter to death, you know. <laughs> okay. Now that that was that was a good explanation, Jen. Thank you so much because I, I think that that clearly you know gave us some of the basic ideas because I think that will help a lot of people here. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. You're welcome. Prashant. Um, yes.
Dinakar sir, are you there? Yeah, Prasha, very nice call. Yes. Parkinson in that machine, can we do the fetal echocardiography? Parkinson shift, shift, SWIFT, new machine. Then what is the new advantage of that machine? Volution shift compared to the normal volition. What is the advantage? From the first, from the second. From the second. Can we do the fetal echocardiography in that? Or we need a baby die or something like that. Are you able to hear the Peter? I don't know. If uh, was, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't able to hear the question clearly. Peter, uh, this is Ganesh Prasad. Can you hear me? Yes, he I can hear you. Know, he wants to know the volume on Swift. Can it do fetal echo? The yes, the volume on Swift can also do fetal echo. Um, however, such functions that we discussed, uh, like the fetal HQ, are not part uh, of the Volusion Swift as of right now. But, but from an imaging performance point of view, or from an imaging capabilities point of view, it can absolutely do fetal HQ, yes. Hi, uh, a, actually a small query from my side uh, to AJ. Uh, the thing is actually in when it comes to Vivid, uh, so you are telling about uh, uh, 2D strain and 3D strain. So is there uh, a possibility like should we have a separate software for the uh, Vivid uh, to see uh, if at all if you want to have a 3D imaging done? Other than the probe, is it a, a separate software should be there for the Vivid? Sorry, can you say that again? I didn't quite catch it. So I want to know whether uh, if we want to uh, uh, have a separate uh, software for 3D imaging in Vivid, especially when it comes to Vivid. Uh, so is it uh, already enabled? Should we just have the probe or should we have a separate software if we want to do a 3D strain or 3D imaging? On which system are you talking about? Vivid, Vivid IQ. No, we, I, I, I've actually explained earlier on just now that uh, Vivid IQ doesn't have a 3D probe. Okay. Okay. It has a 3D transesophageal probe, which okay. is, uh, yeah, right. So there is a 3D probe, but it is not on the Vivid IQ. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you, if if your delegates have any other question, they can unmute and they can ask. Uh, Arvind, hello, Doctor Prasad. Yeah. Uh, should I start? Uh, we'll just one more minute if any of other questions are there. Delegates, sure. if you have any questions, you can ask because they'll be leaving us now. Peter will be leaving us. Uh, Prashant, uh, maybe. Um... Uh, thanks, Peter, for the excellent presentation. So I, I'm going through. Uh, clearly, the antenatal machines are like well, way advanced compared to what we have in the NICU. I think we have all kinds of 3D, and you know, it looks very nice. The fetal HQ again. I think it's based on uh, speckle tracking. Again, uh, is it a research tool as at, at this time, or again, uh, you know, it's well validated? Well, I think. Um, there is quite a lot of uh, literature already available on fetal HQ. I think, um, and I think we're just, you know, let's say on the borderline between a research tool and, and going beyond this. I think um, the functionality in itself is very well validated. I think where a lot of uh, research is ongoing right now is how to translate uh, results or findings that come out of fetal HQ into, into patient management, right? So, you know, what does a result uh, that you find, whether it's changes in, 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 in size or shape or contractility, 
mean for this for a particular patient and how how may that influence your uh, your decision to manage the patient I think you know this is uh, this aspect is is something that's currently heavily under uh, clinical research that is that is definitely ongoing but from a you know from a finan from a from a functionality point of view you know all aspects have been you now have been broadly evaluated uh, and 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 validated and and so that is one aspect um, there are additional studies ongoing right now for example to to uh, validate or do additional validations on the normograms that are on there you know potentially for different uh, ethnicities and different different patient populations um, those those are studies that are ongoing right now as well um, but you know again so this you know I think this is really the picture where we are at the moment thanks Peter yeah, for Jan here, last question, uh, you were talking about the probe, different types of probe. So you mentioned about the matrix probe. So um, uh, what what is the difference between the matrix probe versus the regular probe? And uh, where can we use this particular probe uh, in the neonatal uh, scanning? Jan? I think you have to unmute, unmute uh, your Jen. Obviously, I'm not. I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. Well, okay. The the matrix probe itself is actually basically there are. Uh, it's a different technology now, but uh, it has got uh, no. Uh, well, uh, we have a matrix probe which is actually on the M5SC as uh, as you know the ones with the rings, the blue rings around. They are actually the ones that is matrix now. Um, what we have today on the pediatrics probe, they have got, uh, they are not on matrix uh, probe uh, level yet. Uh, that is, um, there is nothing to be talk about, as in, you know, there's no difference as in the quality, but of course, it's a different stack. Um, I mean, itself is another topic to talk about uh, probes, but uh, um, the matrix probe, they, I mean, they are all the same, it's just that the technology is a little bit different. So the M5SC actually gives, you know, there's an active cooling stack right behind the lenses. So um, they are the same. So it's about the pen penetration. For example, the M5SC is, has, a, it is a probe which is a very uh, low frequency probe, which helps when you have very difficult patient to scan. Okay, so what you're having for the NICUs for the neonatals, you needed to have probes which is high of higher frequency. That, that's why you have uh, the 12S probe, the 6S probes that will cater to the, 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 the pediatrics uh, or the infants because they do not need to have too too much to deep. There, there isn't, in, I mean to say that the, you didn't need to have a low frequency probe to penetrate because they don't have a very thick uh, chest wall like the adults. So uh, what you have there, 12S, 6S, and the, um, the uh, 3SC is very good, is very good coverage already for all the uh, different types of uh, presets, ranging from cardiac to abdominals to vascular. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Janhi. Uh, I think uh, we had a wonderful discussion and uh, um, I am I'm proud that I have one of those machines here, Vivid IQ Premium, the latest one. So uh, I'm experiencing uh, the uh, you know technology which you have brought in in the machine. It is really fantastic and it's a pleasure to use. And uh, I'm also learning a lot about uh, speckle tracking and tissue tracing and tissue doppler as well. So uh, it's something new for us as well uh, yes. here. So, and I happen to have, you know, see, uh, use the Volusion as well for my, uh, just had a baby this month on November 5th. So I was very excited to see uh, the 4D image. I was very excited to see the flow of, uh, you know, blood across from head to toe. I didn't leave the radiologist. So I made sure that, you know, he, he showed me each and everything from aorta to posterior tibial artery to dorsalis pedis artery. So the images are fantastic. And even anybody can read because the clarity is so good and nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jan Hay, for uh, your wonderful session. 
Dr. Dinekar, sir, would you like to add something? You are in a flight. I can see that. <laughs> sir, I am in flight. We last played the sari. Okay, but anyhow, it was a very good uh, this thing. And really, Martin, it was nice. Jen, really, it was nice. Lot of questions are there through Ganesh. I'll be asked a lot of things. Sorry, I'm in the flight. I lost later. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I have I have one question. I have one question to Peter. Uh, so Peter, I wanted to know. It's actually a great presentation and great to know about uh, this uh, speckle tracking. So uh, when it comes to volume assessment, especially LB volume, LA volume, I know this most of the uh, uh, GE machines now it is AI integrated, right? Mm -hmm. So what is your take on AI, especially in LA volume and LB volumes, which also I feel. It gives a, a kind of uh, it is a plus point for us along with speckle tracking, especially in volume assessment, whether it is a valvular heart disease or if you want to know a ejection fraction. So I think uh, it yeah. is a great uh, tool for us, especially cardiologists to know that. So what is your take on that? Um, thanks so much for the question. Um, I, as of right now, uh, fetal HQ and the volume measurements that it provides for the left ventricle are based on the Simpsons rule. Yeah. And however, I think we're in, in terms of developments where we're right now really at a turning point when it comes to uh, additional integrations of, of, of functions that, that are built using artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes our life much easier, I feel, compared to the sense. <laughs> yes, and yeah. I, I think so too. And I think we're going to see much more of those uh, in in the next years to come, not only on volusone systems, but also on 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 all other systems. And I think yeah. the the challenge the challenge for us is a little bit on how to prioritize, right? Yeah. Because there's 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 so many different uh, possibilities to use artificial intelligence, um, and and even we I, should consider, I think, uh, the different. Uh, uh, whether uh, it's like European built and even Indian South Asian built, even the body habitus uh, matters a lot when it comes to AI, especially yes. volumes when we are considering volumes. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is also why we have collaborations around the world um, to actually, on the one hand, also generate, you know, data for, you know, for curation and validation of AI algorithms, um, but also you know, particularly, you know, to, to also hear from clinicians, you know, what, you know, what is the biggest potential and where are benefits uh, where AI could really help. And I think particularly when we look at the fetal heart or also programs such as fetal HQ, I think, uh, you know, in the long run, AI can really help to be a workflow simplification, but also help you know, to reduce inter and intra observer variability uh, of such of, of, of such concept. So um, as of right now, um, we're not there yet, but there is much more to come with artificial intelligence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Thank, thank you. And I have one suggestion for Janhi and GL share that uh, I, I would request you to, you know, uh, release some YouTube videos about uh, the understandings about the basics, like how you explain now uh, about the basics about the newer technologies which has been introduced in the machine, because which will help us. Because I, being a owner of a, one of your machines, uh, it, it takes time for an application manager to come understand, and then by that time we might we might may not have any cases, or uh, cases might get discharged, or uh, you know, uh, or things might be a little difficult for us. So that is one suggestion. <laughs> So kindly release some videos, some tutorial videos regarding this, where the neonatologist perspective, where we can understand it better. Uh, that will be really helpful. Yeah. Yes, I uh, have. Uh, uh, well, I think I can do it on behalf of Peter too. We actually have a club, which is called the Volusong Club and also the Vivid Club. So if you are, if you have a machine, you can yeah. always sign up and that tons and tons of good things that you can find yourself in a lot of different technologies and technical things that you want to learn you know with uh, case studies and obviously you know uh, you could you know there are lots of opportunities uh, so yes join the club 
and you will get uh, the informations you want. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Janhi. So we'll move yes. on to the next topic. Thank you once again, Peter. Thank you, Janhi. We'll move on to the next topic. Prashant, uh, uh, Prashant, thank you for uh, I think, uh, thank you. Maybe the club, if there is something um, like relevant to neonates, like, you know, the, of course, the Vivid, uh, you know, the IQ club. So please do let us know how we can join so we can kind of get some, kind of learn something from you. Thanks so yes. much. Thanks, yes. Prashant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Arvind, over to you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, uh, Jan and Peter, and thanks, Dr. Prashant. Uh, let me just share my screen before I get started. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen here. Uh, yeah, yeah, we can see your screen. Go ahead. Great. First of all, thanks, and uh, it's an honor to be here uh, talking to all of you. Uh, I think we had such wonderful presentations over the last one and a half hours. It's so interesting to see. And even for us at GE, it's amazing what the other teams are doing. Uh, I'm going to spend some time here on talking about our phototherapy uh, solutions. Uh, just trying to move the screen. It's not moving. Just give me a second. Yeah. Click on the screen and then on the left corner, you'll get arrow. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, as you can see here, I mean, we have a whole range of solutions here. I think we talked a lot about um, imaging, uh, but uh, G has a lot of solutions, as you know, right from LND uh, to uh, the NICU, starting from diagnostic, monitoring, and therapeutic solutions. And uh, we'll spend a little bit time today just talking about, uh, you know, uh, neonatal jaundice and what uh, G has to help you uh, manage and provide care for such patients. Um, you know, uh, basically, phototherapy is, is to help uh, the breakdown of uh, bilirubin. And uh, there are different solutions that GE has. However, the key three parameters that you know one looks at while uh, trying to identify the solution and the suitability uh, is you know wavelength of light. Uh, as we know, uh, the breakdown happens only in a, a certain wavelength. The AAP guideline states that it's between 430 to 490 nanometers. And then there is also a certain level of irradiance or, you know, in, in, in more easier understandable terms, intensity uh, of this light. Uh, this is typically measured in microwatts uh, per centimeter square per nanometer of wavelength. And uh, again, AAP guidelines here is that it should be more than 30. And finally, you know, the surface area in which this light is, is put on the patient. And, uh, you know, it's not like more is better. It's also about how uniform uh, on the surface area does this light fall. So, you know, any, any sol phototherapy solution, if you just look at these three axes, you know, you'll be able to understand you know, the suitability and the performance of that device. And uh, I will just like to spend some time here. I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, offerings from GE, but, you know, common to all of them is that we use, you know, blue light LED technology. Uh, this LED technology uh, does not induce any in impact on uh, thermal environment, especially say if the baby is an incubator or warmer. Uh, it does not cause transepidermal water loss. Uh, essentially, you know, it's a very safe uh, light um, and uh, there are no infrared or UV rays also emitted. Uh, as I said, it does not, it's very efficient as we know LED in real life. So it, there is very less heat transfer that happens. There is only just light transfer that happens compared to the halogen or traditional CFL technologies. And in addition, it's also much greener, much less energy consumption and lower electricity costs. I mean, these are things that we know about LED and that gets transferred here as well. And finally, they are very, very long lasting and durable. Uh, so this reduces operating and maintenance costs. 
So all of the solutions that GE has comes with LED technology with these benefits. So I'm going to talk about three systems here that we have. One is the Lullaby LED phototherapy. Uh, the second one is the Giraffe Blue Spot Light phototherapy. And the third one is the Billy Soft, which is our blanket phototherapy system. And uh, I'll spend a little bit time talking about each of them, but also in comparison, you know, what suits best for what kind of care. First, uh, spend a little time on Lullaby. So, you know, Lullaby is, uh, you know, got excellent clinical performance uh, with great ease of use and is also highly efficient in terms of total cost of ownership. Uh, in terms of uh, bilirubin breakdown, it has uh, optimal wavelength delivery peaking at 458 nanometers. Uh, it has a high intensity option of 45, as you know, much higher than the AAP guidelines. We also have a lower intensity option, you know, if you want to go for that. And so you can tailor the treatment by the patient. Uh, it also has a fairly wide distribution of space, you know, almost 30 by 50 centimeter area, 1500 centimeter square. And it's able to provide light in that wide area with the kind of uniformity that is mandated by standards. So, you know, that's the that's the engineering achievement here. Uh, in second point, I would like to maintain here is about the ease of use. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in the next slides, but it's extremely easy to use, easy to customize to, you know, the kind of bed you have and uh, so uh, easy to operate. And finally, it's also very quiet. Uh, I think 22 dB is, you know, what we measure, which is very, very uh, whisper quiet. And finally, it comes with the advantage of LED, which is, you know, long life and uh, reduction in replacement costs. So I'll spend a little bit time here. Uh, as you can see, the the recommended wavelength is between 430 to 490, uh, but Lullaby LED has a wavelength between 450 to 465. That's a very tight uh, spec. And uh, so we are able to provide more light around this optimal care point of you know, 458. Um, irradiance, uh, you know, we have two options, 45, uh, which is the higher intensity and then 22, which is at the lower intensity. And you can tailor the treatment depending on, uh, you know, the, uh, the, in, the intensity of the treatment that the patient requires. Finally, the surface area and uni uniformity that I talked about. Um, you know, if we were to uh, consider a you know full term infant here, uh, the coverage area, if we can split it, you know, say by 10 by 10 centimeters or 5 by 5 here, you can see that uh, uniformity has to be uh, across the surface area of the baby for the treatment to be effective. And this is why you know each of the systems comes with a recommended length or the, the distance between the light and the baby, because at that recommended uh, distance, you have the right level of uniformity. So uh, this for LED PT is 35 centimeters. Uh, for some of our devices, it's slightly different, uh, but it's important that you know it's kept at this distance to get the maximum uniformity. Uh, and so, you know, the, the intensity of treatment is not uh, such that it's more in one part of the surface and less. We want it to be fairly uniform. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, we also have some studies here which says that, uh, you know, at this optimal wavelength, a high intensity and uniform distribution, uh, we get a faster serum bilirubin breakdown. Well, you know, spend a little bit time on the usability. Uh, I think uh, for some of these devices, usability and you know how it fits into the other devices in the NICU is also very important. Um, we have a whisper quiet operation for the LED PT, less than 23 dB A uh, rating, and uh, it's been designed without any fans to dissipate the heat inside the light bank. And uh, it's significantly more quiet than the IEC guidelines of 60 dBA. And this is purely based on our design here. And then, of course, uh, we have uh, the ability for the LED light to be focused. So there is no glare on the caregiver. 
and then um, you know this also helps them uh, not have any side effects like you know headaches etc that are caused by you know light that spills out of the surface area um, in terms of uh, compatibility with other units uh, the the head of the device can be removed and be kept on top of incubators um, you know for for providing you know therapy to patients and uh, because it's lightweight and this uh, removability helps it for seamless use with incubators and then i would also like to just point out the other factors here the height is adjustable and it's lightweight for easy movement and then of course you can also change the uh, light bank uh, angle to ensure that uh, the treatment is provided at the right distance depending on where the patient is there and finally total cost of ownership i mean uh, leds are reliable and our leds are rated up last up to 50000 hours um, which almost is almost 6 years of continuous operation and uh, you know this this basically reduces in a dramatic reduction of replacement costs including the costs of downtime and uh, in addition leds being uh, energy efficient uh, you also save on electricity uh, you know up to 80% less than other phototherapy systems like cfl or or halogen systems if you really look at the total cost of ownership at almost the same acquisition cost your bulb replacement cost and electricity cost add up a lot for cfl and for lullaby led pd you know they are almost you know 80% lower I'll just uh, stop here and uh, this is uh, the LED phototherapy system to summarize. You know, it has a wide surface area coverage and a lot of configurability uh, to work with several kind of beds, you know, warmers, uh, incubators and so on. Uh, next, I'll move to the blue spot uh, PT uh, light phototherapy system. Now this is a, you know, is a, a single LED light in one lamp and it, as you can see it's a circular one uh, with a with a with a goose neck design as we call it now this neck design can be moved around it's sort of a flexible pipe and uh, you know essentially what we have done here is to enable this design so that it can focus the light therapy at the patient surface uh, even though it has a smaller surface than the LED PT it really allows you to focus the light therapy of the patient because of this flexible arm. And uh, this also has compatibility with the Panda and Giraffe, uh, you know, care station and Omnibeds uh, and helps you to save the NICU space. Uh, in, our, in terms of, you know, LED light itself, very similar specs, you know, exceeds all the guidelines. You know, we have a higher radiance of 45. The distance maintained here is to be 38 centimeters. Uh, meets the spectral uh, wavelength that is most effective and then we have about you know 1000 centimeters square uh, of coverage at a slightly higher distance of 35 at 38 i think it's uh, slightly lesser uh, in terms of uh, bulbs we this is rated to last up to 10000 hours and of course has much lesser service cost compared to halogen and fluorescent bulbs um, you know a couple of advantages here since it has an at attachment for the giraffe and panda warmers and the incubators, it really allows you to save space here in the NICU. And uh, secondly, because of this neck design, the source of light is here. And so all the noise and heat, whatever it may be emanated, is really away from the baby and away from the caregiver. So if you want the therapy, you can focus the light. If you want to intervene with the patient, you can easily move it out and then bring it back in again. Uh, next, I'll move to the blanket system. I mean, these are uh, very differentiated systems. They allow the baby uh, to be, you know, uh, taken care and swaddled, uh, you know, by the mother or any other caregiver and really has a big impact on developmental care. I'm sure some of you are leading pioneers with developmental care uh, in India, and so you would really appreciate the benefits these bring in. Uh, the, in these, the technology is that there is a generator of light and then through fiber optic cable, the light comes to the, the, the pad as we call it. And these pads can then be swirled around the baby uh, to provide light directly. So there is really no distance here between the light and the surface of the skin. 
the, the skin is essentially touching the source of light, which makes it, as you would imagine, very effective for the treatment and the breakdown of bilirubin. Uh, we also have two types of pads here, 35 and 50, uh, sorry, a small and large pad, which provide you know, 50 and 35 microwatt per centimeter square, depending on the size of the pad. So you could choose the pad depending on the size of the patient. Um, very similar specs in terms of wavelength and light. And as I said, uh, really allows the parents to bond with the child, uh, does not block access to the bed uh, and so on. Finally, you can also use the blanket in combination with the uh, giraffe blue light, uh, blue spot PT light, to provide double phototherapy. Uh, this, this is maybe needed, necessitated for some uh, conditions. Uh, this also allows you to maintain full access and visibility to the baby. As I said, the gooseneck can be easily moved out and the, the blanket is really non-intrusive. So it is still possible for you to provide other therapies or intervene uh, without the phototherapy being interrupted uh, and also allowing more developmental care and inter, inter interactions with the parents and other caregivers. So the, this is just like a snapshot. Uh, I think we have covered most of it. Uh, the spectrum, all of these lights meet the AAP guidelines. Uh, they're all made with blue LED, uh, which is very safe, no UV or infrared, and uh, no, no intervention to the thermo thermoregulation of the baby. Uh, treatment coverages, the sizes are different. You have a much focus, more focused uh, and a flexible arm here to, to you know, sort of aim the light at the surface area you believe will be most effective. This, there is no real space between the light and the surface area, so it's again very effective. And LEDPT allows you to, uh, Lullaby LEDPT really allows you to have a broad surface area coverage. And, uh, and with Billysoft and LEDPT, you do get some options for varying the intensity of the treatment. So with that, I will just like to summarize and say that, you know, uh, you, you, you can choose some of these products and maybe all of them uh, as a mixed fleet within the NEQ uh, to ensure that you can take care of different types of patients. So with Lullaby LEDPT, you have a traditional PT, which is very flexible and work, can work with multiple systems with low cost of ownership and uh, ease of use. And with Blue Spot PT, you can really focus the treatment for the smallest and most critical patients. And uh, think of this as maybe for your sickest babies. And uh, this allows you to precisely position without access or visibility intervention. Uh, finally, you know, with uh, Billy Soft and Blue Spot, uh, you do have a complete developmental care approach um, if you are aware of our giraffe omnibed care station, you do know the one bed, one baby story where right from LND, you know, transport into the NICU, uh, you can just ensure that the baby doesn't need to move out of the bed. And the giraffe blue spotlight and Billy Soft with their integrations to the giraffe omnibed really allows you to take that to the next level. So uh, that's that's uh, all I had uh, for now. Dr. Prashant, uh, let me know if you would like to cover anything else or have any questions. We will uh, 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 have one more question, the final session, and then we'll go for the Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so now I know I can. Uh, thank you, uh, Arvind, for your wonderful session. You have covered most of it regarding the phototherapy. So we will move on to the next uh, session, uh, the spot Billy care screening. Mr. Ben, after that, we'll take up the discussion. Thank you. You can stop can sharing. You? Yeah, I'm just uh, doing that. It's... Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ben. Um, can you hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, we can hear you and see your slides as well. Go ahead. All right. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm uh, very glad to be here with you. I would like to introduce to you today uh, the BillyCare, a neonatal non-invasive bilirubin meter. A little bit about neonatal jaundice. Uh, it is a normal process that occurs in the first days of life, as we all know. More than 60% of the babies will have jaundice. Although treatment is not uh, usually required, it is a case of concern for, uh, for all of you caregivers and anxiety for the families. And most importantly, if not treated in time, neonatal jaundice can lead to uh, permanent brain damage. Today, we have, uh, we have three uh, screening methods for neonatal jaundice. We have the old visual assessment. The visual assessment is not really reliable. Uh, it can lead to uh, overestimation of the risk, which means unnecessary lab tests. Visual assessment can also lead to un underestimation of the risk, which could result in a failure to, uh, to obtain necessary lab tests, which is important. The TSB, total serum bilirubin, this is a lab test. It requires a heel prick, which is painful for the baby. It is also, uh, it's also costly to the hospital and time consuming. I would like to present to you the third method, the past continuous bilirubin, the TC TCB. It is more accurate than visual assessment and uh, study demonstrate a high correlation with the, uh, with the, TS with the TSB. I would like to introduce to you the BillyCare. BillyCare is a transcontinuous bilirubin meter. It uses transmittance technology, which is a little bit different than the other devices. This technology uh, brings some great advantages to, uh, uh, to bilirubin uh, measurement. Um, first, the BillyCare is less sensitive to motion artifacts when you try to, uh, uh, to measure the bilirubin. Uh, it also uses automatic pressure, which makes it very simple to hold and very, very easy to use. A very important advantage that we have with the BillyCare is that there is no need for periodic calibration. And periodic calibration means that you have to send your device for calibration. That means uh, it comes with a cost, and it also will dictate a larger install base of uh, bilirubin meters. We can do that because uh, we use a very reliable light source. We use uh, LED light which is uh, powerful enough and very stable. The, the BillyCare uh, comes with a reusable probe, but it also allows the user to use a disposable tip cover. So you can decide if you want to use it uh, with or without disposable uh, tip covers. It has a touchscreen display and a built-in barcode, uh, barcode scanner that you can uh, use to scan uh, the baby uh, and the nurse. The BillyCare can also interface uh, with a PC or transfer the data to a hospital information system. It has a, a, a viewer uh, and the viewer automatically produce a report for you. It can give you the trend and it can also give you a monogram, a nomogram presentation. That was come in a box of, a, of, a, of the BillyCare. Uh, you get the device with the cradle, you get a uh, uh, cradle we use for charging, and also we use it for uh, to interface uh, with the PC viewer and hospital information system. We have a blue container with the calibration tips. Uh, this is a great advantage because you can uh, check the calibration, you can pro perform a calibration check anytime. So you don't have to send the device for calibration, but you can check the calibration anytime you wish. It also comes with a power supply, a set of 10 disposable tip covers, and a communication cable. Measuring with the BillyCare is very, very simple. Just open the clip, place the units on the patient's ear, as shown in the pictures, and the rest is automatic. As you can see, the device is uh, small enough to hold, very easy to handle. The measurement site is the upper part of the ear. The pressure is automatic, which is a, a, a very, very, very important um, 
it's very, very like it's a light pressure. So we have a clip that goes over the year. Um, the pressure is only 100 millimeter macro, which is a little bit more than the systolic pressure of the baby, which is about 80 millimeter mercury. So it's just a little bit higher. The baby won't feel it, and it takes just a couple of seconds to get the results. So the result is displayed like you can see on, on uh, the screen right now. You can see the date and the time. You can see the patient ID. You can have a second patient ID if you wish, and you can also have uh, the nurse name or the nurse ID. The presentation is uh, in micro milligram to uh, deciliter, or you can also use micromole to uh, per liter. So the Milliker comes with a viewer, and the viewer can uh, produce for you uh, the report. It's automatic. All you have to do is to add the date of birth of the baby, and uh, the software will uh, present to you the trend. You can also have the trend on a nomogram view, so you can uh, uh, assess the risk uh, over the age of the baby. Um, you can print the report, you can export to a PDF format, or you can send it via email. And as I said, this is very easy to use. It's automatic. There is, it's not time consuming. Uh, just add the date of birth and all the rest will come uh, automatically. Now let's talk about uh, TCB versus TSB uh, in general. Uh, I can tell you that the Billicare demonstrate high correlation with the TSB test. It's not a lab test, but it is correlated to TSB. Um, I have, however, a non-invasive uh, measuring device uh, reduced the risk of infection. So instead of uh, poking the heel of the baby, drawing blood, uh, you can use a non-invasive uh, screening tool. Uh, it is reducing the amount of blood work test. And it's also reduced the stress of the mums, which is important enough. With the Billy Carrier, you can take as many measurements as you want and as often as you wish. So you can really go for a trend. You can't do a blood test every other hour. Uh, but with the Billy Carrier, you can, you can do your measurements as many as you wish. You get immediate feedback. You get it within seconds. So it saves you time, it saves complication. It's also get a happy mom, which is also important. Now, not less important, the Billicare based TCB protocol saves money. And here is why. Please follow me on that table that we have over there. We assume uh, in this table uh, 48 hours admission period. Um, and the monitoring of the bilirubin every eight hours. We use average cost of $1.5 per TC TSB test for a lab test. May not be the cost in your hospital. However, every lab test has a cost. And it's also important to say that you will need probably at least one lab work for every baby anyway. But we still can save five blood works for each baby on the course of 48 hours. So on the course of a year, it's a lot of money. The bottom line is that the Billy Care saves stress, save pain, and save a lot of money. But thank you very much for the opportunity to present the Billy Care, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Uh, now the session is open, so I would like to invite our panelist again, Dr. Nilesh. Dr. Nilesh? Five percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your views on uh, these two topics and uh, uh, any, any questions from your side? Uh, no, ex excellent uh, presentations. I think um, uh, nothing in particular. Uh, any other questions are there? Any from the audience? Yeah, yeah. See, the Ben, for you, there's a question. Uh, they want to know how accurate it is post phototherapy. See, we do check transcutaneous, use transcutaneous millimeter before phototherapy. 
after phototherapy is given is it reliable in using transcutaneous bilimeter and how reliable is your any studies which has been published based on that thank you very much for the question this is a very great one um so as of now uh you have to wait with the billy care for about three hours before you can have a reliable photo uh um, measurement after phototherapy um uh, but uh, we are working now trying to, uh, we have a claim that we can do better than that, uh, but it probably will take us some time to demonstrate uh, results. So this is something that we work on. Uh, we're not there yet, but we know that our technology can allow, um, and because we do the measurement on the ear and because the ear could be protected from the light uh, during the phototherapy, we believe that for the long run we'll be able to demonstrate um reliable uh, measurement after phototherapy but as of now for your questions you have to wait three hours uh, so you are telling after three hours of phototherapy gap you can go for uh, measurement and the measurement will be same i mean uh, uh, same accuracy as pre phototherapy measurement correct ben that's correct yes all right uh, so you have told about the normogram which uh, you give us in the software uh, when we are taking the report. So it, it is a normogram uh, which is developed by uh, GE which you give or because uh, we have different uh, normograms available for uh, bilirubin assessment. Uh, so which one do you use? Uh, Dr. Meisels. Sorry? We use the monogram that was uh, published by Dr. Meisels. Okay, Dr. Meisels, okay. All right, uh, because generally we, we use a different normogram. That's why we were curious to know. Um, second thing is um, for uh, phototherapy, um, you had told that it's 50,000 hours, uh, Arvind, uh, the total uh, usage hours. Yes, Dr. Uh, Prashant. Is there any uh, yearly maintenance or anything like that, or it is just the 50,000 hours? After that, you have to go with your, go with, to replace uh, with a new one. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, 50,000 hours is almost six years. Uh, I mean, even if you use uh, some calculations there to arrive at that. So I, in the interim, there are really no, uh, you know, uh, you know, maintenance as such of the lights. But we do recommend that uh, we we calibrate and understand the intensity of the lights uh, periodically. So you know we do have the Billy light meter, which helps measure the irradiance. Uh, we want to ensure that the irradiance always remains in spec, you know, uh, to our light. So we would recommend that we do that calibration every year. Uh, and uh, this, uh, when, when it comes to wavelength of uh, the phototherapy units, uh, it is a what wavelength range do you use in your phototherapy units? So between 420 to 470, or which wavelength do you use? Uh, the, the recommended guideline, uh, Dr. Prashant, is 430 to 490 nanometers. Uh, the most effective uh, is, I think, around 458. So all our devices have a much tighter, uh, uh, you know, range around 458 than the recommended guidelines. It, uh, uh, as I said, amongst the three, it varies slightly. You know, some have uh, a different wavelength, but uh, for our uh, most of our, uh, you know, wavelength uh, difference is around 15 to 20 nanometers, around 458. See, you you were told about three different uh, with spot blue light. Billy blanket and this all three have same wavelength or it's a different wavelength. Yeah, they have uh, slightly different wavelengths, uh, you know, and that is why, you know, they also need slightly different because they're all at a different distance, ideally from the surface of the baby. So as I said, for LED phototherapy, uh, the distance is uh, 35, uh, whereas for the blue spot, we recommend it at 38 centimeters and uh, Billy soft is at the surface of the baby. So, you know, to keep that in mind, uh, the the specs are slightly made differently so that the treatment is more effective. Yeah, so there is one more question, uh, which I'm sure G is working on. This is about the home phototherapy units. So are there anything which is coming from G regarding the home phototherapy units? That's an interesting question, Dr. Prashant, especially in times of COVID. 
the Billy Soft, which is the blanket, uh, you know, is actually approved for home use in some of the countries where there is regulation. For example, in the US, uh, it is allowed for home use. Uh, considering that if, uh, you know, neonatal jaundice is the only reason for the patient to stay back, uh, you know, maybe it does not make sense in a COVID kind of environment. So we have seen, in fact, a huge in, in increase in demand for home care for the Billy Soft because it is uh, it is not so, uh, I would say, intimidating to the parent to just uh, put the baby in the blanket and, uh, you know, it helps them to continue to provide care and swaddle the baby. Uh, we believe that the Billy Soft is already sort of ready for home care. Uh, I think uh, it's also a question of uh, acceptance by uh, caregivers and by parents uh, to do something like that at home, you know, for us to take that to the next level. Yeah, what, what is the difference in all the three spot uh, Billy Blanket and uh, the phototherapy units, the regular phototherapy units in terms of how uh, quickly the uh, bilirubin comes down? That means they're specifically asking about the photoisomerization which happens from bilirubin to lumirubin when you give phototherapy with that particular wavelength. How quick uh, uh, compared to all these three different uh, formats, what you have? Uh, we, we don't have a comparative uh, study there, Dr. Prashant, to, to share with you. Uh, as I said, you know, in terms of wavelength and in terms of irradiance, these are the two clear, clear uh, you know, factors to help bring down the bilirubin. They are very similar. It is just that in terms of surface area and the way the uh, phototherapy is mounted, um, is different and also we believe that uh, you know the use uh, case you know slightly, the use case slightly different here slightly uh, in terms of you know how sick the baby is how how much the baby is able to uh, how much of other intervention the the patient needs uh, that determines it more than any difference in in care so i would say that they are almost the same uh, it's just the fact of usability and interaction with other devices that you would need to make a decision on this. Yeah, Ben, you have a question. Uh, why uh, Billy Care selects the uh, the upper part of the ear lobe to check? Uh, is there any validated data uh, based on which you have done, or it's because the the thickness is less? And uh, what 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 is the rationale behind it? Um. Thank you for the question. So uh, this is a very uh, thin place where we can easily, without a lot of pressure, remove the blood and then shoot light and measure the wavelengths. Uh, as, as I said, we use transmittance technology, not reflectance like the other devices. So uh, this is a very thin place. We can use a very light pressure uh, to shoot the light and to read the waveforms and get the results. Okay, uh, because uh, all other, as you rightly said, uh, they use a different parts like, you know, over the bones they use, and especially over the chest, uh, which gives more accurate measurement when it when they are comparing with other uh, uh, spot to check. Um, there, there is one more uh, issue with the Billy Care is the battery life. Uh, the touch screen is good. The display is good. Reports can be generated. Accuracy is good. Even for post phototherapy, this is more better than the other uh, devices. But when it comes to battery, it just switches off within 20 to 40 minutes to the max. Uh, and if you have not charged properly. So is there anything which uh, uh, where we can, you know, uh, uh, save the battery life or uh, anything which can be done from our side as a user? Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, I would like first to say about uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the question before. And that uh, brings me back to the technology. We use transmittance technology versus the reflectance technology uh, of uh, the other devices. Uh, the advantage in this is that with the reflectance technology, you have to be very accurate with the pressure and with the angle that you hold the device. You also have to undress the baby because most of the time you don't like a very high light source on the forehead, which is close to the eyes. So you have to undress the baby. Uh, when we use the ear, uh, first we use a very soft LED light, which is not really a bright light. And also, um, it is very, very easy to use. You don't have to undress the baby. You can just use the free ear that you have. So it is uh, easier to approach to the baby, and the baby will not even feel that uh, it was tested. Regarding the battery, the best practice is to uh, leave the Billy, uh, the Billy Care in the cradle 
every time that you don't use it. Many tends to leave it uh, out of the of the of the cradle, and then um, it is losing battery. Uh, that uh, the from our experience, a battery, a fully uh, charged battery, will last um, more than four hours, four to five hours uh, of use of of continuous use. Uh, and normally you don't use it continuously, but many times uh, people tend to forget to put it back in the cradle. They put it in their pocket or they put it on the desk and they don't put it in, the, in, in back inside the cradle. Yeah, uh, so probably uh, I've, I've been using this from last, uh, I think, three years uh, or between three to four years. I'm the first person probably in Karnataka to use in a clinic, not in the hospital setup. Uh, this Billy Care machine. Uh, it is fantastic. It's my experience as well because I've compared with other devices as well uh, for an year, but uh, I could not uh, present the data. Uh, anyway, thank you, Ben. Uh, so now I require, you. you know, uh, I invite our uh, delegates if they have any question, they can directly unmute and uh, ask our uh, speakers. Prashant uh, Nilesh, uh, one, one quick thing. There have been some uh, recent studies with uh, respect to Billy Care and Transcutaneous, mm -hmm. where they kind of you know block a patch of the skin. Mostly these studies are on the you know the abdomen, and then uh, the you know re uh, reliability post phototherapy using Transcutaneous. So I presume uh, using Billy Care it will be easier because it's easier to block the ear, possibly. Uh but the variation is not much as Dr. Mr. Ben told. After three hours of stopping phototherapy, if you check, the variation is not much. Uh, even I have experienced that. It's good. Even post phototherapy, you don't have to do anything, blocking nothing. So, and uh, it's very, very even with, uh, ripple, like very intensive phototherapy. Also, that holds true. Uh, ben, um, so it depends what type of phototherapy you will use. Um, uh, as we just saw in the presentation, there are um, various uh, phototherapy li uh, lights. Uh, but as I said before, uh, for the long run, we are working on uh, for you to be able to be able to uh, check uh, to use the Billy the Billy Care during a photo, even during a phototherapy. Uh, please allow us some time to demonstrate some results. But uh, uh, this is something that we are working on uh, right now. Uh, Safely, we can say post uh, for the therapy three hours post for the therapy. It is real. It is a you, you can get a reliable measurement. Yeah, uh, Dr. Ravi Kanna, do you have a question? You have raised yes, your sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. We have got LED phototherapy units in our unit. The problem is there, there all the lights are blue. So when you switch on a light, all the baby appears signals all the time. The surrounding also appears a bit blue all the time. So why isn't a white light given in between? So that we can see the true color of the baby while under the care. We have to switch off the food therapy unit or switch on the radiant environment light to assess the baby's color. Why why a white light is not provided? It's a very simple thing, I think. Why is it not? What is the logic behind it? Along with blue food therapy bulbs, a white bulb should be incorporated. Why is it so? What is the logic? Uh, thanks for the question, Dr. Ravi. You are suggesting that uh, there is an observation light in addition to the blue yeah, lights. There should be. With okay. the blue therapy bulbs, there should be one light also going on. That will give a true color of the baby. That will show the true color of the baby all the time when the baby is under care. And the baby is received for therapy as well. Just if we incorporate one white bulb in it, which gives a true color. Why, do we, why the baby should be bathed in blue light all the time? For therapy going on, it's okay. But we don't need blue color all the time. That obscures the color of the baby. And that is because difficult. When you switch off the light, you want to switch out the for therapy, the baby appears gray, as if the baby has become has gone into shock. That is a real observation. Uh, that's a great uh, uh, feedback, uh, Dr. Ravi. I, I think uh, we will incorporate that going forward. I mean, I, I do understand it's not there today, but thanks so much mm -hmm. for the suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, delegates, if you have any question, you can kindly unmute and uh, you can ask our, uh, our speakers. Thank you, Dr. Ravikana. Is there any other question? Uh, 
all right uh, so uh, we have with us our president and nf uh, karnataka state chapter kotreshi sir kotreshi sir dr kotreshi sir dr kotreshi sir are you there you can unmute and uh, you can speak sir yeah i think uh, there are no other further questions so thank you very much on behalf of nnf karnataka state chapter for your wonderful presentation and uh, giving the uh, perspective about the latest technology and uh, the use of uh, uh, you know uh, the multiple uses of uh, the imaging machines and uh, the rational behind uh, the phototherapy units and uh, transcutaneous uh, bilirubinometers thank you very much thank you ben thank you arvind and we would like to thank genmux for their wonderful support for the nnf karnataka state chapter uh, thank you one and all have a great uh, sunday evening we'll catch up with uh, new topics with the uh, latest trend and technology um, in the equipments in the coming days on uh, next next session will be on this coming wednesday and then on sunday